Imagine you're in a world where wallets are thicker than Bibles, where our political banners fly higher than our church steeples, and where the glow of our smartphones outshines the light of our hearts. Welcome to the world that we live in, y'all. Our idols have taken the throne of our hearts and silently dethroned the one who promises us eternal life. Now, as we go through the message today, I want us to ask ourselves this question. When did we last check in on our devotion and who or what actually sits on the throne of our hearts? Let's get into it. Welcome to Gobi Church. I am Pastor Shane. Our scripture today comes from Lamentations 3, 34 through 45. We're going to be using the NRSVU translation, but you can use any version that you like. And it says this, When all the prisoners of the land are crushed underfoot, when justice is perverted in the presence of the Most High, when one's case is subverted, does the Lord not see it? Who can command and have it done if the Lord has not ordained it? Is it you have not from the mouth of the Most High that evil and good come? Why should any who draw breath complain about the punishment of their sins. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us have lift up our hearts as well as our hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled and you have not forgiven. You have wrapped yourself with anger and pursued killing without pity. You have wrapped yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. You have made us filth and rubbish among the peoples. Now, this is where I would normally say this is the word of God for us, the people of God, but this is a really, really dark reading. I have well established in my time as a pastor that I do not believe that God brings evil upon us in order to test us or punish us or teach us a lesson. But as I've already mentioned throughout this series, the authors of Lamentations did believe that. And so the undercurrent of these poems is an acceptance that God brought about the destruction of the temple and the Babylonian exile as a punishment for the various communal sins committed by the people of Judah. So instead of making the argument tonight yet again that God doesn't bring evil as a punishment, I want to use our time together to consider exactly what the people of Judah believed God was punishing them for. What sins could they have possibly committed against God that would deserve such complete and utter devastation and desolation of the people of Judah? Dun, dun, dun. Now, to get this answer, we actually need to look across the rest of the Hebrew Bible. The nation of Judah, particularly leading up to the Babylonian exile, was criticized by various prophets for engaging in practices and behaviors that went against the covenantal laws God gave them. The sins can broadly be put into three categories, idolatry, social injustice, and failure to obey God's laws. And so I'm going to briefly touch on the specific issues of each. As for idolatry, Judah worshipped other gods, particularly Baal and Asherah, and incorporated their practices into their worship of Yahweh. They were even bringing symbols of these other gods into the temple, which just blurred the lines of worship of Yahweh and those other gods. And we see that in Jeremiah and 2 Kings. First and 2 Kings also points out they were building shrines and practicing sacrifice in these other public spaces. So in short, they were cheating on God. They were worshiping other gods, incorporating those rituals into their lives, and breaking the covenant that they had with God. Now, as for social injustice, the nation of Judah was under constant fire from the prophets for exploiting the poor, the vulnerable. The prophets Amos, Micah, and Isaiah all repeatedly condemn Israel and Judah's exploitation of the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner, or what we might call refugees or illegal immigrants. And these are groups that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, specifically and explicitly protect. And Judah was doing things like the practice of lending money at unreasonably high rates of interest, the use of unjust weights and measures in trade to cheat people and the manipulation of legal proceedings to favor the wealthy and the powerful at the expense of the poor and the vulnerable. There was also high corruption among both religious and secular leaders. Jeremiah and Ezekiel tell us that they were taking bribes, perverting justice, and they just generally failed to protect the rights of the needy. And Nehemiah and Jeremiah also tell us that they ignored the Sabbath year, and these were the years for rest for the land and the people, which were supposed to ensure the recuperation for the land itself and the cancellation of debts for the people during Jubilee. Both of these actions, spelled out in the Torah, were for the benefit of the poor, and they were to promote economic equality. And Judah continued to exploit the land and the people for the benefit of the powerful and the wealthy. And as for the failure to obey God's laws, well, we've seen some of that already in these previous two, but specifically here, we're talking about the general neglect of rituals, festivals, and dietary laws 
that were specifically meant to set the Israelites apart as a holy people dedicated to Yahweh. Where we like to think of God's law as being the law for everybody, the original purpose and intent of the law for the Israelites was so that their identity as a people was distinct from those around them. They were disobeying the rules specifically laid out for them as a people that were meant to identify them as a people. And as a result, they continued to ignore and outright reject the prophets sent by God to call them to repentance, and they often persecuted them. So what's the point of this exercise? Well, it's to say this. We had better hope and pray that God does not bring evil upon nations as punishments for these types of communal sins. Because if God does, then, oh boy, United States, we have got a problem. Say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Now, if I had read that list of sins against God without any context, it would have been extremely easy to think I was describing the current state of the United States. Exploiting the poor, the vulnerable, perverting justice, just generally failed to protect the rights of the needy. So for the next little bit, I'm gonna do something that the church hates to do, and that's list our own sins against God. Because if we really believe the view held by the authors of Lamentations, this should give us pause to reconsider ourselves, to repent and to cry out to mercy for God, just as they did in Lamentations. Now we have engaged in the worship of idols. Oh yes, we have given our allegiance and love to other gods, money and wealth, consumerism, obsession with the latest tech gadget, seeking validation through likes and follows, idolizing celebrities and political figures to the point of emulation, when love for country justifies unethical actions or diminishes the humanity of others, when we treat national symbols like our flag and our national anthem as infallible or beyond critique, when we make career success the ultimate aim, our excessive devotion to sports and entertainment that distracts us from facing personal issues, engaging in community service, and pursuing spiritual growth, our blind allegiance to political ideologies that lead us to actions that contradict the ethical and spiritual values Jesus actually died for. And when we elevate our personal freedom above communal well-being and neglect the interconnectedness that is the linchpin of the church community. I can literally go on and on here. My list was about three times longer, but we don't have time. When we make these or other things central to our identity, and don't kid ourselves, we do this all the time, we are replacing our worship of God. We are worshiping idols. And we have engaged in the sin of social injustice as a matter of course in our modern culture. It's not a bug. It is a feature built in from the foundations. Economic inequality, racial injustice, healthcare inequality, immigration policies, homelessness and housing insecurity, environmental exploitation, education disparities because of income inequality, mass incarceration and the prison system designed as modern day slavery, labor injustices such as unfair labor practices, non-living wages, unsafe working conditions, and the suppression of workers' rights to organize, and food insecurity in the form of food deserts, and the fact that anyone in this country of abundance is allowed to go hungry. Oh yes, y'all, we commit the sin of social injustice every single day in our country and almost always in the name of profit and production. And finally, we are guilty of failing to keep God's law. The core of Jesus' teaching on the law is encapsulated in the command to love God with all one's heart, soul, and mind, and love one's neighbor as oneself. Just as the dietary laws and rituals were the things that set the Hebrews apart from the surrounding culture, it is the Christian's love for God and neighbor that sets us apart from the surrounding culture. So when we commit any of the sins I've already mentioned, we are failing to keep God's law. And so I'm going to say again a few of the ways in which we fail to keep God's law. Neglecting the vulnerable, cultural divisiveness, economic exploitation, healthcare disparities, lack of compassion for immigrants no matter how they got here, continued racial injustice, environmental exploitation, consumerism and materialism, individualism and self-interest, and just a general indifference or apathy to injustice. When any of these are a part of our existence, we fail to keep God's law. And when we dismiss or attack the people that call our attention to these things, we are committing the same sin that Judah and Israel inflicted upon their prophets of old. So again, I say we had better hope and pray that God does not bring the kind of desolation and devastation being felt in the book of Lamentations. But there is good news. The good news is that Jesus showed us another way. Jesus showed us that love, not destructive punishment, is the way God chooses to correct us now. Grace is the primary mode of God's involvement in changing our lives, changing our hearts. Jesus showed us that God is not interested in retribution. God is interested 
and restoration. So even when we do commit these atrocities against God, the God of grace and love, by inflicting them upon ourselves and our neighbors, we know that we can always turn around and find God there waiting with open arms, not a cosmic paddle for a big old spanking. Or to use a big biblical language term, we can repent and turn back to God. It is far past time that we reinstall the God of love, compassion, and true biblical justice on the throne of our hearts and our lives. Amen? Amen. All right.